Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the National Museum of the United States Army. I'd like you to introduce you tonight to our moderator, Dr. John Moss. Hi, folks. Uh, welcome to tonight's book talk uh, with our, um, our author, Catherine Sharp Landek. Uh, good evening, Catherine. How are you? I'm very fine, thank you. Thanks for having me. Great. Okay, great to be with you here and talking about your great book. And uh, there's a, for, for those of you who haven't uh, picked this one up yet, this is it on the cover, uh, the cover of the book right here. Um, and so I am going to introduce, I'm going to get a, get a couple of little things fixed here on my end and we should be good to go. Okay, so welcome again, Kate. Uh, very good evening to you, and thanks for joining us. Uh, let me introduce uh, Kate to those of you um, who have not met her yet. Uh, she is an associate professor of history at Texas Women's University, the home of the WASP uh, archives. Uh, she was a Guggenheim, a Guggenheim Fellow at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum and a graduate of the University of Tennessee, where she was a Norman scholar um, and earned her PhD in American history. She's received numerous awards for her work on the uh, WASP uh, program, the WASPs in World War II, and uh, she has appeared as an expert on NPR's Morning Edition, uh, PBS and the History Channel. Her work has been published in the Washington Post, uh, the Atlantic and Time Magazine, uh, as well as numerous other academic and aviation oriented uh, publications, journals, what have you, magazines. Uh, and uh, what I was very most interested to learn about her is that she's a licensed pilot <laughs> and who flies whenever she can. So again, Kate, a very good evening to you. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Good. Well, in your honor, and I hope you can see this, I wore a very special tie for you that <laughs> is uh, uh, interwar period uh, vintage aircraft. So I got this one out tonight just for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. So uh, we are going to um, uh, start with some questions uh, after a brief overview, and then we have some slides to show. Um, uh, I, uh, Kate was nice enough to give us some slides uh, to go along with the book. And I think what we're going to do is probably hold most of those to the end and go through them so you can explain them as we go. Um, so why don't we start out, if you would, by giving us a brief overview about what the WASP, uh, I don't know if you call it a program or a service or uh, the WASP service, what was that uh, and, and what was the trajectory from its beginnings in, I guess, 1942 uh, through 1945. Yes. Um, so, you know, the basic story of the WASP, of course, is that they are um, the women Air Force Service pilots from World War II. Uh, and they served from 1942 to December of 1944. And they were basically brought in, uh, General Henry Hap Arnold of uh, the Army Air Forces. Um, had been approached, you know, as early as 1939 by Jacqueline Cochran, a prominent uh, aviator of the time, as well as Nancy Love, another well well known and, and talented pilot, uh, to bring women in uh, to the Army Air Forces to serve and to take some of the the flying work that needed to be done um, off of the shoulders of the men who who needed to go overseas. Arnold you know, resisted as long as he could, but by the fall of 1942, as I'm sure uh, most of the folks here know, you know, the war was not going well for the United States in the fall of 42. We're, we're just getting into North Africa. It's a tough fight. We're just spooling up all of our uh, manufacturing in, in the United States of all these hundreds of thousands of aircraft that are going to need to be flown from the factories to the points of embarkation. Uh, and so he decided to give women a chance to fly. They really did consider it an experiment to see if women could fly these military airplanes. Uh, the, the women didn't like it when I called it that, when I when I give talks with them and we talk about it as an experiment. 
uh, but that's really how the Army Air Forces saw it. Um, and so they brought women in initially as ferry pilots uh, to uh, fly uh, for the Army Air Forces, for the Air Transport Command, initially in light trainer aircraft, you know, uh, everything from uh, Pipers, Piper Cubs to Taylor Crafts. And then they very quickly were able to prove themselves as pilots and moved up into AT6s uh, and then eventually into P-51s, P-38s, all of the, all of the pursuit aircraft. Uh, then the job expands beyond that uh, into a, a greater, greater experiment, if you will, once they realized women could be counted on to, to fly these military planes, they moved them into all sorts of jobs that needed to be done, uh, whether it was towing targets behind airplanes or um, flying non-flying personnel from place to place, flying uh, uh, aircraft that had been damaged and um, needed to be test flown, just basically any job that, that needed to be done. Uh, Jackie Cochran, who ended up leading the program, ended up, you know, talked about it as uh, called the women aerial dishwashers uh, because they would they would do all the flying that needed to be done. Nobody really wanted to do, you know, flying in a pattern back and forth, towing a target isn't particularly exciting other than the bullets coming at you. Uh, but but uh, uh, you know, it it needed to be done, and the women were there to to do that work. Okay, great. Well, as we start talking a little bit more about the history of it, let's let's start though with uh, you writing the book. Where where did you go for records uh, for the the pilots, the program, how it got started, and, and where are those what what sources did you use, and where did you find them? Right, that's I love having a chance to talk about that. Um, you know, I started my work on the WASP in 1993, uh, was which is when I met my first WASP. Uh, and in that same year, I got very fortunate in that they voted as a group. You know, they had come together in the post-war period and uh, formed a post-war organization, and they had voted to make Texas Women's University their official archives. I was a graduate student at University of Tennessee uh, by 1996, and you know, so there was an archive. It didn't have much compared to what it has today. Today, they have tens of thousands of photographs and letters and diaries, uh, but they had a start. So it was a great starting point to to come down. Uh, I drove from Knoxville to Denton uh, and uh, did research in the library there. Uh, but a lot of the official papers. Uh, of the WASP are right there at the National Archives uh, too uh, in College Park, Maryland. So all the Army Air Forces uh, materials, the, the uh, official records, the official um, documents, and of course now some of it is actually um, online. Um, historical report number 55 is really the big one and you can, you can find that online now, uh, which you know, is wonderful. It's a little frustrating because I had to print it out on microfilm, you know, borrow the microfilm and, and print it out with that smelly paper uh, a dime at a time. But but uh, but I'm very happy that it's it's available. So um, there are a lot of great resources available now. Um, I think one of the pieces that I love doing the most um, is uh, there weren't very many oral histories or stories from the WASP themselves. Uh, so that was something that I did um, starting in 1996. I interviewed uh, about 125 WASP individually and then did a lot of follow-up interviews with those same women. And then I got questionnaires uh, from another hundred or so in addition to that. So, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a good lesson that you can create your own sources uh, to a certain extent, if if the people that you're studying are still alive, um, and and uh, so that was that was a great advantage as I got to actually hang out with the women for the last 25 years, uh, and and consider myself very fortunate at that. Good, good. Um, now, one of the things that was very interesting to me in the first several chapters is this whole notion of 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 flying being a hobby across the country mm -hmm. in this period and that there were there were seemed to be dozens and dozens of of private 
airstrips and these young women, some of them who came from money, but some of them who basically spend all their, their part-time job money uh, either taking flying lessons or going up in the air. What was the, what was this sudden spread of of uh, civilians getting involved in in, mm -hmm. uh, in flying at that time? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And uh, you know, these women, I've got a line in the book that I love and was grateful my editor didn't didn't make me cut because it, you know, that that they this was the um, golden age of aviation, and these women came of age in its glow. I mean, they really did. You know, if you think about many of these women were born 1919 to 1921 uh, and they um, they grew up hearing about Charles Lindbergh. They grew up hearing about uh, Amelia Earhart. Many of them went to the big parade after Lindbergh did his flight. He did parades all across the country and people as far as Tulsa, you know, were talking about they got to go and sit on their father's shoulders while they watched Charles Lindbergh go by. Uh, others saw Amelia Earhart um, at different airports as she gave talks, especially to young girls. So this this whole era of this golden age of aviation was so significant. My favorite book on this era is Joseph Korn's book um, called Winged Gospel. And I think that really talks about that, that 1930s period. Uh, so it was just the, the air shows and the air races were more popular than football, which is hard to believe in this day and age, but it really was so common. And so many people wanted to fly uh, across the country and, and women were no exception to it. You know, I, I know we'll talk about the start of the program in a little bit, but the, um, the program, once it started, had 25,000 women apply. And I had often had, um, I often thought Jackie Cochran kind of made that number up because she did that sometimes about her own past and such. Uh, and uh, she didn't. I found the box at the National Archives uh, and it's, it's several boxes of, you know, onion skin paper where young women had written, please, I want to fly. How can I join this program? Or 40 year old Iowa housewives, you know, farmers wives saying, I really want to fly. I really want to do this. Uh, and it was just really um, humbling to see how many women wanted to do this and wanted to, to have their chance to be a part of this program. Of course, only 1,830 even got accepted into training, uh, mm -hmm. but, but it was just such a passion for that whole, uh, that whole time period uh, for, for everybody. So uh, this was the brainchild, I think you said, of Jackie Cochran and uh, Nancy Harkness Love. Mm -hmm. so how did this, uh, uh, no pun in, or pun intended, how did this get off the ground? Right. Uh, so, you know, Nancy and Jackie both had their allies within the, the Army Air Forces. And I, I saw a question about the Air Corps. Um, this was the broader Army Air Forces, uh, which, which begins in July of, of 42. So these women fall under that. Uh, but the, the WASP, the idea of getting these women programs started, uh, they have women that are going to be brought in as ferry pilots. And Nancy Love is designated as the leader of those groups. So it's a group of 28 highly experienced pilot. They, pilots. They all had to have a 200 horsepower rating. Uh, they averaged over a thousand flight hours of experience, which is a lot. Uh, and those women went to Wilmington and started flying with the fairing division right away. They had a, a brief training period and then, and then right away were flying. Uh, and then you have uh, hundreds of other women in the United States that had their licenses, but maybe didn't have the flight time or didn't have that high horsepower rating. And so uh, Arnold said, well, let's have Jackie Cochran take those women and train them to fly the army way. And then once they've got a little more experience, feed them into the ferry pilots. So this is really two arms of one program where you've got these women who are training, getting a little more experience, and then going to ease right into that uh, fairing program. It'll, it'll change the next summer of, of uh, 43 and get that new name 
of women Air Force service pilots. Um, but but uh, the beginning of it, it all starts in that fall of 42, where you immediately have women ferrying those planes. Uh, and then this other group of women that first goes to Houston, Texas uh, to train. Then if any of you have been to Houston and no offense if any of you are from Houston, but it's not great for flying. <laughs> there's a lot of fog, there's a lot of rain and they were flying out of a commercial airport there. Um, you know, they they take their little Piper Cub on the runway right after the, the um, you know, Delta's uh, DC-3 had taken off and, and things like that. So uh, they moved out to Sweetwater, Texas uh, for that training. So when when these women signed up for this, were they actually joining the army or were they civilians? I think that's a great question. So one of the things about the beginning of this program is the Army Air Forces would bring civilian men in and they would let them be on a sort of probation for 90 days and then make them second lieutenants, right? It was, it was just a way to get more pilots in, guys who had some experience and things like that. And that was the plan for the women, was to bring them in, have them serve for 90 days, kind of prove that they could do it because a lot of the generals weren't quite sure if, if girls could do it. Uh, and then make them part of, the, part of the Army Air Forces officially. In reality, what happens is, is you get all sorts of games and politics and things that get mixed in where they feel they have to write a special bill to bring the women in. It gets wrapped around the Women's Army Corps, which I know, um, you know, you being the Army Museum know a lot about, uh, whether they're gonna write the WASP into the bill that goes from the WAC W-A-A-C to the WAC W-A-C and it just gets all jumbled um, until it's finally it's the summer of 1944 when the, there's a fresh bill to bring the WASP in formally and and they get turned down you know it comes up before Congress a week before or a week after D-Day so it was really bad timing uh, but but uh, the short answer to your question is they were technically civilians the entire time they served. So um, one of the things I read in the book that uh, you emphasize is, is, is that two of the primary responsibilities in their mission was uh, ferrying aircraft from the manufacturers to uh, Army airfields, mm -hmm. uh, which would later, which the planes would later go overseas. Mm -hmm. And another one was uh, towing aircraft as uh, uh, and the, the aircraft being towed was a target. Can you tell us kind of uh, briefly what those two activities were like and, and, and the value of all that? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, we build, uh, the United States builds hundreds of thousands of planes during the war uh, and they have to be flown from the factories, you know, from Dallas, from Los Angeles, from Detroit, you know, uh, and we're fighting on those two fronts. So they've got to be flown. Some of them get flown to different bases where they get modified and things like that. Uh, others get flown right to the coasts. You know, we're we're supplying uh, we're supplying the the uh, Russians. So we've got planes being flown up to to uh, Alaska that are then being picked up by the Soviets. Uh, you know, this is an incredibly important movement of aircraft, not just for the Americans who are going to be flying these in in both theaters of war, but our allies who are going to be flying these American planes. Uh, so the women would fly them to those points of embarkation. They'd fly them to the coasts where they'd be, you know, saran wrapped and put on plane on ships for the smaller planes. And then uh, the bombers, men would pick up and, and fly the rest of the way. But it was incredibly important. Uh, and by the end of the time of the WASP in December of 1944, the women ferry pilots, there are only about 300 uh, of the women actually serve with the ferry command. Uh, uh, they're flying a huge percentage of the pursuit aircraft because they can really specialize in those types of planes. Um, and then a second piece, as you talked about, is the, uh, and it was really the first uh, leap uh, into other work out of the ferry command into other work was the towing of targets. Uh, and the women would. And, and men were doing this job too, but you've got all these young men who are 
being shipped overseas uh, as gunners on the ground or uh, going to be in B-17s, you know, manning the weapons. Uh, and you've got to give them a chance to practice. Uh, so you would put a target behind a plane and it could be everything from an A-25 to a B-17. You put a target and I guess a way to think about this is if you've ever been to a beach or the football game or something like that, and you guys are in Virginia, so you're close to beaches probably, but, but uh, you see a little plane towing a banner, you know, advertising pizza or whatever. But now imagine that only the banner is a little further away and it's a target and the men on the ground are firing live ammunition at it, uh, depending on the gun. Uh, often color-coded ammunition so they could say which which gun had, had hit the target. So the planes would fly very specific patterns, very specific speeds, very specific altitudes, so that they could know exactly um, what the, the men were hitting and why. Mm -hmm. And then again, they would do it behind B-17s, so the gunners uh, would have an opportunity to fire and those men on those planes uh, practicing their firing, they got three shots before they were sent overseas. Imagine being 18 or 19 years old and being shipped over uh, with that amount of experience. Well, let's let's show a couple of pictures now then, because the, sure. the what I have them lined up, um, we can see a few of the images that you're talking about here about some of the planes that were flown and also the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, towing of the other uh, airplanes. Um, but as, as um, we get the slide up, the... Um, First one here, can you tell us, this, is this a B-17? It, it is, it is. So this is, um, so one of the things that they did uh, once they kind of expanded the role of the women beyond ferrying, uh, and, and this is, again is when they become women Air Force service pilots in the summer of 43. Uh, and I just, some of you may already know since we've got kind of a smart crowd here, I think, uh, is that the Army Air Forces had service pilots. The men had an S on their wings uh, for these service pilots. So these were simply women service pilots and the service pilots did all these domestic jobs that had to be done. And uh, Arnold was known for liking nice acronyms. Uh, so I haven't found the piece of paper to prove it yet, but I'm pretty sure he's the one that said, okay, slip something in there and they put Air Force in there. So it's WASP. Uh, so it's women service pilots, but these women Air Force service pilots. Uh, so exactly, Goldwater was a service pilot and he was important to the WASP later on. Uh, but one of the experiments was whether women could handle these heavier planes. And, you know, these are, these are going to take some real arm strength and, and leg strength to fly these planes. Uh, so they took 13 of these women, <coughs> excuse me, and, and trained them. Uh, at Lockburn to be first pilot in the B-17. So this is just a shot with, with uh, some of the women with her crew. Uh, the woman on the far left there is uh, Dawn Seymour, who was a good friend of mine. Um, she lived to be 100 uh, and, and I had knew her for, I don't know, well over 20 years. But then this, these women went down to um, Florida, most of them, and uh, did the towing of the target behind their, behind their B-17. Uh, but but it, it took a lot of strength to be able to do this job. Okay, uh, we have one more that I want to show that goes right to your point here. Uh, the next one uh, will show that, you know, these uh, women were not in shirt and tie up there and skirts and like uh, mm -hmm. you know, typical uh, uh, army women's uniforms at the time. And this is a great illustration showing that uh, they were, you know, doing everything with the equipment or what have you. So uh, what, what, is the, what is the significance of this uh, image, Kate? Well, I think, you know, this is one of my favorite photos because it shows these are, these are active pilots. They've got their parachutes on, they've got their, you know, their ties. And I think you're quite right that, that they're not wearing the, the uniform of the WAC. They are wearing Army Air Force's uniforms, the pants, the, the shirt, the tie. Um, in, in most cases, the WASP do end up getting their own uniform uh, but often when they were at bases, they would they would uh, wear the the same uniform as the male pilots. I particularly like this one because you can see in the far right the two men standing there just watching these women <laughs> walk down the walk down the runway after after a flight, and and uh, so that's uh, 
that's that's why I like this picture so much, just because they're so confident and they're just talking about their planes and these guys are like, what's going on over there? <laughs> now, one of, one of the, our audience members asked, is that, are those B-26s? Uh, I'm not sure from this angle. I think they are. I think they are. Okay. Uh, the next slide is my favorite picture uh, from the book, which uh, looks to me, is that a Dauntless that's that's uh, mm -hmm. going and that's that's the wreckage or or some target. Uh, is that a, like a cloth target behind the uh, Dauntless that that mm -hmm. the are gonna be exactly. Trained? So this is a shot. This is um, Dora Dougherty uh, was one of the first women at Camp Davis, North Carolina, and this was in her scrapbook. And I'm not sure if she is the one taking this photo, which you can see, you know, the shadow of the pilot taking the photo, or if she's the pilot flying the plane. I, I'm not sure which, but but um, this is her and and one of her her uh, fellow pilots. And yeah, you can see the target that has obviously been shot. I like this one besides the aesthetic beauty of it, right? Seeing the shadows and and things like that. But you can see the in the back seat of the plane. Um, you can see the the real man, right? So you'd have the pilot in the front and then the real man would be in the back and it was his job to reel out the target and then reel it back in before they landed. Uh, so so it was a, a crew of two for each of these flights with the, the women flying the plane. And again, you have men doing these same jobs, but women were able to take, you know, 1,102 of these jobs and, and allow the men to, to go do other work. So um, these these uh, pilots, the women pilots, they they were held to a pretty strict standard. This wasn't like a a summer flight camp or or just right. going away for a couple of weeks. And one of the things that was interesting is they, you know, they were responsible for formations and drill and appearance and education. Mm -hmm. uh, why why did Jackie uh, insist on that so much? Right, I, th I think that's a really good point, John. And um, so the expectation was that these women would be brought into the military. So when they were in their training, they went through uh, they went through standard, you know, military training. They worked out of the Central Flying Training Command's uh, demerit book. Uh, they did all sorts of of uh, that type of thing when they were on bases, they were treated as officers, they were allowed to go to the officers club, they ate in the officers mess, they saluted and were saluted. Uh, the plan was for them to come in as second lieutenants, although some would be brought in at higher rank based on how much time they had served. Um, and, and it was just the full expectation that they were going to be military, so they would be treated and behave as military. And even in training, as the training grew, the number of hours of ground school that they had to um, learn military protocol. They had a whole class on military forms. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was full expectation that they would be doing these things. I do want to address, I saw a comment about the Navy plane. At Camp Davis, they had both A-25s and, and the Navy uh, planes, uh, and they would alternate um, where they would fly both um, there at Camp Davis, just to address that point. Sure. Now, uh, one of our uh, one of our listeners mentioned uh, Goldwater, which kind of brings up the point that um, this again, this program really got its boost from some important Army officers and uh, especially Hap Arnold. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I think you mentioned the book um, uh, Bruce Arnold and Barry Goldwater. Uh, but initially. Um, um, Arnold wasn't really a big fan originally because he they wanted to find uh, enough men pilots first, and then when it suddenly came about that uh, the scale of the war uh, was going to be such that they wouldn't be able to rely on that. What 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 brought Arnold around, and was he a, a long term supporter of this? Yeah, I think so. So um, you know, half Arnold had a lot going on, <laughs> as you know, uh, and. Uh, Honestly, you know, he knew these women pilots. He knew Jackie. He had served with her on a number of committees, the Harmon Trophy Committee and things like that in the late 30s. A lot of these people knew each other. They, uh, several of them belonged to the Long Island Aviation Country Club. So uh, Arnold and uh, uh, 
Robert Olds, the dad of, the, you know, Robin Olds, who becomes famous in the, the Vietnam War. Um, General George uh, is, is a big supporter of the women as well. Uh, but, but the reality <laughs> is that bringing the women in did make things a little more complicated. You have to worry about housing. You have to worry about, you know, those just logistical kinds of issues. Uh, and he just didn't want to deal with it is my interpretation of, of what I'm seeing in his memos and letters. And he didn't want to deal with the publicity of looking like we were that desperate that we had to have women pilots. That's why he never let them fly overseas. They never went overseas. They never served in Europe, any of those things. He didn't want the enemy to be able to say, look how much trouble the United States is in. They're so worried they've got to let girls fly. And that was that was the tone, right? Because everybody looks at the Soviet Union and sees them letting women fly in combat. It's like, oh my God, the Soviets were really desperate, right? Uh, and Arnold resisted a lot. He knew women could be good pilots. He, again, he, he knew Jackie Cochran very well and she had won all these awards and was this great pilot. Um, so once he agreed to let them fly, he was all in uh, and, and let the experiment expand into all these different jobs that they could do. And again, the women had these great advocates in, uh, William Tunner was a huge advocate. General George was a huge advocate. Uh, again, Robert Olds uh, was an advocate, though he tragically dies um, of a heart attack during the war. But it was, it was really the desperation that they needed pilots so badly that they would bring these women in. And Arnold's idea, and he was supported in this by Jackie, of course, was the idea that the women would be releasing men for other duties, uh, not replacing men. And we'll see that come back to hurt the women in, in the fall of 1944 when more men are coming back. All right, Let, uh, as we, we're gonna pull up another image here and I wanna make sure we get uh, time for questions. And, and let me just remind folks that if you, if you have questions, please ask them in the day and uh, we will try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, so uh, this is a group of, of women pilots and men here. And what plane is that? So this is of course, one of my favorite images. This is the B-29. Um, and in this image on the left there uh, in the, the uh, cap is Paul Tibbetts, uh, of course, who goes on to fly the B-29 Enola Gay uh, against Hiroshima, dropping that first atomic bomb. Uh, the two women, uh, the one standing closest to um, Tibbetts is uh, Dee Dee Mormon, and then that's Dora Dougherty, uh, Strother McCone, uh, uh, standing next to her. And what was going on with this, the B-29, of course, was developed by Boeing during the war where a lot of our other planes, the B-17 and others were older, had been, had been developed in the 30s. The B-29 was, was built from scratch uh, during the war. Uh, it, very necessary, high altitude aircraft, pressurized aircraft, uh, and could carry a lot of weight. Uh, very essential to the war in the Pacific. The reality is it had problems when it was first built. Uh, the cowling around those engines was too tight. Um, and this idea of fire was a real issue. Uh, they had several fires, they had several problems. Uh, and then they had a very tragic accident with a very good team of Boeing test, test pilots and engineers on board um, in which they crashed just short of the runway in Seattle all were killed and they landed, crashed into a meatpacking plant and killed many people on the ground. So it had a terrible reputation. Um, Tibbetts had been tasked with getting this plane in the air. Pilots were refusing to pilot, to fly it. And he saw Dora come in in an A-25 and stick the land, a really tough crosswind landing. And he's like, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna use, we're gonna use this. And so he brought Dora and Dee Dee and it's hard to tell in this picture because it's just a group of short guys there, but, but uh, 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 Dora and Dee Dee were both about my height. They were right about 5'5". Five five. Uh, Tibbetts, who I had the great fortune to, to know pretty well, uh, was probably 5'7", five 5'8". Five uh, so he picked these women and 
spent a few days training them to fly the B-29, got them their CAA um, uh, type rating uh, in the B-29, and then took them and, and this whole crew who was very happy to work with the women, uh, took them to bases across the country where the B-29 was and had the women give demonstration flights to the male pilots uh, to, to prove to them uh, he argued it was so easy to fly, even a girl could do it. Uh, and uh, he laughed when he said that, you know, we talked about the chauvinism of the men. Um, and, uh, you know, the men themselves ended up being grateful for it. Uh, Dora and Dee Dee both got letters after the war from men who had gone on those demonstration flights and then gone on to fly the plane during the war and thanking them for giving them the confidence to fly it and what a great airplane it was and that sort of thing. But this this tactic of using these women to show again how easy a plane is to fly, even a girl can do it, uh, was used, you know, in the 1930s uh, to sell airplanes and it's used in in, in other cases. <laughs> excuse me, of, of uh, these planes as well. So uh, you can see that, that Tibbetts had the plane painted uh, with Fifanella, who's, who's here, who's the wasp's uh, mascot mm. and, and named Ladybird uh, in their honor. He really, again, I, I had a great opportunity to know him fairly well and he really admired Dora and Dee Dee and um, you know, they, they remained fast friends uh, long and long throughout their lives. Let's pull up uh, another image that uh, this one's in color uh, that you sent me of, of some pilots here. And if you just briefly tell us what this is, we have a few more and then we'll get to the questions and then that's probably going to wrap us up. Sure, sure. So this is um, this is just a few of the women in training uh, in Sweetwater, Texas, and you can just see the big blue sky and, you know, the sandy, sandy soil beneath them. And uh, I just think it's one of the one of those beautiful beautiful images. Uh, you know, the women went through training, they went through primary, basic, and advanced training. Uh, and you can see their, uh, you know, jumpsuits. These actually fit these women pretty well. I think this is a later class. Uh, you know, the earlier classes, they were, um, you know, very large and extra large men's, men's outfits. But you can see how young these women are uh, and, and how happy they are. Well, uh, I have, the next slide is one I'm going to show you, uh, which is the uh, Julia Ledbetter's wasp leather jacket. Ah. And that is, uh, I'm not sure we can see it uh, down at the bottom, but she was qualified on the B-17 and after World War II had a 26 year army career. And this is uh, um, an exhibit at the Army Women's Museum at Fort Lee. Oh, and that is so beautiful. Really Tracy Bradford for, for getting me the image and uh, I thought you'd like to see that one. Um, I, do, I do. Thank you so much for sharing that. And you can see, um, so the leather patch of Fifanella on there. Um, uh, Julie, I had a chance to know her and uh, those early classes, class 43-3, I think was the first to do it, is they had artists, you know, so many of these women were so talented and they would hand draw Fifanella on these little leather patches and then cut them out and stitch them on their jackets themselves. Uh, and then you can, of course, see the Congressional Gold Medal there and the statue, uh, one of the wasps uh, that I knew as well, um, uh, Dot Swain Lewis made uh, full-size statues of the wasp, uh, ones at the Air Force Academy, um, uh, ones in College Park, Maryland, ones in um, a smaller one is in Dayton, Ohio. But, but uh, Dottie um, sold those for fundraisers to help pay for the big statues. She made all these little statues. Uh, it's, a, it's a great, great thing. What a terrific exhibit. Thank you so much for sharing that with me. It looks terrific. So let's get a couple of questions in here if we can. Um, one, of, one of our uh, uh, listeners and, or audience uh, asked about the 99s. Did the 99s play a role and what is that? Uh, sure. So the 99s are uh, uh, they're a group of women pilots. They still exist today. They're based in Oklahoma City, uh, but uh, they were started by a group of 99 women pilots at a time that there were only 117 women pilots. Uh, in uh, the late 1920s, Amelia Earhart was the first president of the organization, but Louise Faden was a huge part of that. Uh, and this was a group that 
really helped women pilots have a, a community. Uh, Jackie Cochran was actually the president of the 99s when she started the WASP. So one of the ways she helped recruit women was to contact the 99s and send notices out through the 99s to help recruit them. And then the WASP actually get back together in the post-war years in 1964 for the first time uh, at a 99s uh, dinner in Cincinnati, I think. So the 99s are definitely a big, a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question is the, um, did you use the uh, Women in Military Service of America uh, database in your research? You know, uh, I did not because it didn't exist when I started. <laughs> okay. um, I, I, uh, I'm very happy to see it and uh, I think it's a great thing, but, but it, it didn't exist when I, when I was doing my research. Um, were women of color allowed to participate in the I, I think that's a wonderful question. They were not. Uh, the armed forces, of course, were segregated at the time. Uh, there were, uh, I have found the names of at least six uh, black women who applied to the program uh, and uh, were qualified, but they were given a letter of rejection based on their race. Uh, there were two Chinese American women who were part of the, uh, a part of the program, uh, uh, Hazel Ayang Lee, uh, who was from Portland and a very prominent and uh, well-respected pilot, was a ferry pilot. Uh, she ended up tragically being killed just in the final month of the program when another B-38 pilot came in and um, their radios were out and he landed right on top of her, he couldn't see her. Um, but, uh, and then uh, Maggie G, who was in the second to the last class uh, was, was in as well, but uh, it, was, it was not a diverse group at all. Okay. So um, a few folks are, are, have asked questions here about uh, kind of the end of the, the service and, and um, their status. Um, and uh, one asks, if technically civilians, uh, was that a principal factor in denying them veterans benefits? And I'll use that as a way to get you to tell us uh, what was their status? And then there was a there was kind of a fight so to speak, for many decades after the war mm -hmm. about uh, recognition and benefits, things like that. Can you tell us what what happened in the time we have left? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, in December of 19, you know, in, in the summer of 1944, the bill, and there had been several, but the final bill to bring them in to the Army Air Forces was before Congress. And again, this was, you know, it, it came before Congress in a couple of weeks after D-Day, um, you know, and uh, the the there was a huge lobbying campaign against the women by some civilian male pilots who'd been flight instructors for both the Navy and the Army Air Forces. Uh, our numbers of men surviving, uh, pilots surviving overseas was going up, uh, thanks in part to those uh, tanks in the, um, the, the long range tanks on the P-51 escorting the bombers all the way to Berlin, that kind of thing. Uh, so the Army Air Forces and the Navy cl started closing those flight schools and those male civilian pilots all of a sudden found themselves eligible for the draft. You know, they'd been in draft deferred positions. They look around and they see all these women flying these planes and say, we can do it too. They lobby a great deal. I saw somebody comment on Drew Pearson uh, the, that uh, this idea of, um, you know, why are you letting all these girls fly these planes? Are they batting their eyes at the generals? That kind of thing. Uh, and um, it was just, just too much, uh, too much against the women. So the decision was made to end training, uh, to let the women who were already in training finish, uh, but, but to let them you know, to, to not recruit or train any more women, which if you look at all the numbers kind of made sense. Uh, then in October of 1944, the decision is made to end the women's flying altogether that, that on December 20th, that'll be it. Uh, and the idea is that they'd be home for Christmas. Um, Jackie Cochran fought and even General Arnold fought to get these women recognized as military, at least for a day. Um, you have 38 of the women who were killed. 
during the war, uh, either in, in uh, active flying or in training missions. Uh, and they didn't, their families didn't get to put up the gold star. They didn't get any real benefits. They got, you know, a $250 civil service benefit. Uh, there's one flight in particular where there's a, an instructor, a male instructor and the female student and her family got $250 and his family got $10,000 uh, because their status. Uh, so there, there was this real effort, but uh, in the end, in December of 44, they're sent home. Uh, but they'd been trained, they'd been expected, they'd served as if they were in the military. Uh, so finally, in the 1970s, they get together and fight to be recognized as as veterans. And this is where uh, people like um, General Arnold's son uh, steps in and uh, Barry Goldwater, who, you know, Barry Goldwater was the only senator that vote, voted against the Equal Rights Amendment. I mean, he's, he's the father of modern conservatism, but he had been a service pilot with the WASP and, and flown alongside many of these WASP and knew the work that they had done and believed that they should be veterans. So he really was a huge ally and advocate uh, in helping the women get recognized, which they finally were in uh, November of 1977, they were recognized as veterans. Um, and, you know, they missed out on the GI Bill of Rights. They missed out on all of those benefits. Uh, they did get uh, the ability to go to um, VA hospitals and, and that kind of thing. And the, one of the biggest things for so many of these women was the right to have the flag on their coffin, uh, which, which they still uh, are so grateful to, to have at this point. Kate, I know we have to let you go here pretty soon. Uh, can you tell us what you're working on now? What what can we expect from you, uh, uh, academically or popular uh, a book, uh, a project uh, uh, in the future? Right. Well, I appreciate you asking. You know, so I'm I'm continuing to tell the wasp story. I think that's so important, and uh, all my opportunities to do that, I will take. Because uh, I just, it's a, a promise I made to the women and uh, a promise I intend to keep. So I'm, I'm telling their story. And there were so many that I had to leave out of the wasp of, of, of this book. You know, it was twice as long and I had to cut it in half. Uh, so, so there's so many more stories to share. Um, but, but the next story I'm really looking at is at those flight nurses uh, in Europe during World War II and uh, the important work that they were doing. Um, uh, so th their story really hasn't been told. And, you know, the story of nurses in the Pacific and such has been told, but those flight nurses in Europe, uh, especially the, the one who um, was a POW just hasn't been told. So I'm kind of have the theme of, of those forgotten stories. And I really like, um, I really like World War II aviation, so um, I'm gonna gonna try to try to try to do that next. But, but thanks for asking. Well, thank you for joining us uh, on behalf of the National Museum. Uh, we would love to have you uh, continue a relationship with you and oh, yeah. keep up with what you're doing. I want to thank our producer uh, Elizabeth Moore for tonight, and a lot of uh, thanks go to our audience. Uh, for excellent questions um, and uh, uh, excellent comments too. I've tried to keep up with it a little bit while we're talking, but uh, I'm gonna go back and, and, and try to read some more of it. But thanks very much. Um, for those of you uh, who would like to uh, attend another event, we've got a book talk April 15th, uh, 2021 at 7 p.m. Uh, Mitch Jockelson will be talking about the paratrooper generals, so another Kind of World War II topic here uh, from uh, D-Day through Normandy. So, um, you you if you've registered with us, you can you, you can use the uh, links on the registration emails. Otherwise, uh, you can visit us at www.thenamusa, which is t a t n m u s a dot org, uh, and look for events. And we'd be, we'd love to have you. We've got a lot of stuff coming up. We've got a big Civil War symposium in April and uh, lots of stuff, but uh, very much enjoyed uh, the program tonight, Kate, and, and best wishes to you. Well, thank you so much. And, and uh, I do have a website if people have more questions. There's a 
a little contact the author part. And um, so I'm, I'm uh, feel free to, to go to that website. It's just katherinesharplanduck.com. And uh, I'm happy to, to oh, answer great. more questions there. Yeah, great idea. Because we, we couldn't get to all the questions. And uh, but uh, please contact Kate if, if you have specific questions. And again, good evening to everybody. And thanks again. Thanks so much, everybody. I appreciate you. Thank you, John. Okay, good evening.